Have you ever shot a video where you've been speaking like this in it? I can't say I have. Somebody look good. How do you feel? I'll get through it. <laughs> Graham on the other side of the camera. <laughs> I love it. I'm Chris Sankavish. I'm Graham Kennedy. We've been working together on food projects in China for several years now. Um, we both share a love of food culture and food in China, and we spend much of our free time documenting it around around the country through through writing, through photos, through videos, um, and on, for various platforms in China, outside of China, uh, including our own. Uh, in 2021, I started a WeChat account called Saint Cavish. Um, where I can publish as much or as little as I want. And Graham and I started working on that together um, about three years ago. Um, that was for me after about 15 years of food writing in China, uh, deciding to go my own path and to do my own thing and to really dive into the Chinese side of, of food culture here. I came to China a little over 10 years ago and I have been fascinated by the diversity in China, the different cuisine and food. Um, and as a photographer, I'm incredibly fortunate to be able to spend an enormous amount of time on the road in, in so many different areas of China, watching rice harvest and, and um, getting to explore everything from boutique hotels all the way down to different cuisines and food and things like that. So projects like this are, are incredible for me to be able to uh, dig a little deeper into uh, an aspect of Chinese culture which I love, which is the food and, and the incredible range of, of food that's, that is available here. <laughs> so in 2006, I left my job as a chef after 10 years to become a writer. The first story I ever wrote about was about some walk makers that I found in Hong Kong here in Shanghai. Uh, and I followed them for 10 years. <clears throat> I made a video uh, with my friend Ja Li, a filmmaker in New York, who used to live here. Um, we made a, a video about some of these walk makers. Um, and so it's a topic that I've really always been fascinated with and have always, uh, and have always followed uh, from the earliest days of writing here in China. And so in, a few years ago, Sirius Eats, uh, a website in the, that's based in New York, contacted me to write a story about robotic walks, the rise of robotic walks in industrial kitchens and chain restaurants, uh, both in the U.S., in other countries, and a little bit in China. So for that, Graham and I went to a robotic walk factory in Shunda in Guangdong province. But we also wanted to contrast that with the traditional method, uh, hand-hammered walks. And for that, we, also, we went to Shandong, to um, uh, a city called Jiangzhou where um, hand-hammered walks have a tradition going back several decades. Um, and there's a very interesting company there that's actually uh, kind of reviving the craft of hand-hammered walks. And um, so this is an interesting story that's not necessarily about the loss of a tradition, but a kind of the re re resurgence and the revival of the tradition of hand-hammered walks. Yeah, and I mean, what was interesting about that hand-hammered walks was um, it wasn't about it being artisanal so much as it was about food safety is, is why this, this company really was um, so successful still um, doing hand-hammered walks. But um, as a videographer, walking into that room of, of a couple dozen men hammering out walks, thousands of, of, of hits per, per walk to take a chunk of steel into a a walk was, I mean, still my ears are ringing for years later. Um, but uh, just seeing the, the visual elements of, of these um, very humble, you know, the walk, it's a walk. It's, it's such a humble everyday tool. But seeing that story, that, that formation of, of that walk from a piece of metal in a, in a you know, a coal fire kiln to um, getting, watching it slowly getting hammered into a beautiful walk was was so sensational to, to see 
and the noise and the sound and the visual of it. I mean, that was and the a, rhythm, the rhythm, just that constant hammering yeah. um, was was an incredible uh, visual element of it. And for me, it was it was one of our early projects, and and it really sort of it got me excited about how visual these food stories can mm. be. And, and you can easily look past a walk as, you know, a simple kitchen tool, but the story and, and the depth of, um, you know, incredible storytelling visually that you can create around that was, uh, was, was really exciting for me to, to sort of dive into that and, and create, create these images. Yeah. I mean, some of these walks are hammered up to 30,000 times mm. and they just go from um, a steel disc, a circular steel disc, into a very f beautiful finished product mm -hmm. that is checked very rigorously mm -hmm. by the quality control lady who all the walk makers have to pass in order to get paid for the walk, uh, which we saw that process as well. Mm -hmm. So that was a really fun story to contrast those two, those two different styles, the people in Guangdong who are trying to kind of create the walks of the future, mm -hmm. which don't require any skill. They don't even require humans. Yeah. Um, and then kind of the walks of a different future, of a different, mm. of a different idea for the future, yeah. which are a more natural and more healthy, in their eyes, mm. um, method of cooking. And just to talk a little bit about those robot walks as well, I mean, that was, that was such a fascinating um, fusion of tradition and uh, modern technology, because in that, uh, in that factory of robot walks, you had everything from pretty much a, a, a rotating heated uh, barrel barrel that was just lifting up and tossing mm -hmm. meat and then dumping it out all the way to these guys trying to create a robotic elbow that <laughs> could flip and, and do everything. Right. I mean, it was such a fascinating and I, I really felt like they were just trying to figure out how they could automate this process, a right. process that is so human and has so much history to it. And using a walk, I mean, is, is such a skill, mm. um, of which I have not mastered, but is an incredible skill that when you try to just automate it, I mean, there's a million ways you can do it. And none of them are as perfect as, as, as a human elbow, as a human yeah. elbow <laughs> and, and, you know, the old knee on, on the, you know, on, on, the, on, gas. The, on the gas. Yeah. And, um, I mean, that's, that was such an interesting contrast because, um, at the end of the day, you know, these, these walks that are, are simple, humble, and incredibly crafted um, are a tool that's incredibly hard to, to replace with, with machinery and technologies and a bunch of microchips and some programming. Yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing piece of ancient technology that still serves us yeah. very, very well today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. After I had been writing for about a decade, I kind of looked back at what I had done and realized... Um, I wrote a lot about dumplings and noodles. <laughs> it wasn't a plan that I, I had set out on, but in retrospect, I saw that's, that's where a lot of my interest was. Um, and so uh, in 2015 or so, I decided that I really wanted to be more structured about this and dive into it. And I wanted to learn more about uh, Chinese noodles, um, which is a huge topic, and specifically about noodles in the north. So uh, a few years ago, Graham and I went to Shanxi province, and saw I don't know, dozens of different noodles being made. So many noodles. Yeah, we saw a lot of noodles mm. being made uh, in a restaurant at a school that teaches uh, noodle craft. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at a at a restaurant with uh, a private room where they made noodle balloons mm -hmm. and all you know extremely <laughs> fine noodles that can fit through the head of a pin mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. and all or the head of a needle and and all types of things like that. I think I think it's important to say as well that on one hand we're incredibly fortunate to be able to have such access to all this food, but on the other hand we on that trip ate an absurd amount of of noodles. You know, we we had to eat dozens of different types of noodles to understand the flavor and then the texture and and all of this. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, in in that area there's really three types of sauces that go on top of these noodles. <laughs> and, and so on your 36 bowl of, of noodles, um, it's a lot. I still, I still think very fondly of those, of those days eating those noodles, but, um, we ate an enormous amount of noodles on that trip. You know, well, one of the things that people say there is that it's because of the limited ingredients that people got so creative with the different mm. shapes of noodles. Yeah. So they don't have so many different things to be able to make a lot of different toppings. Mm. So instead, they focus on turning the noodles into things that look like uh, seashells mm -hmm. or uh, ears or 
um, every different shape that you can think of. Yeah. They, they have a noodle that. And that another noodle interesting like that. comment that I think was mentioned uh, to us by Higa on that mm. trip was the, the sort of the rise and fall of trendy ingredients, the white flour versus the the whole grain flour versus mm. in how different noodles had you know some of that on the inside and some of that on mm. the outside and. Um, as, as sort of generations handled these noodles, they sort of shaped them a bit differently. And, and, and this is what ultimately accumulated in a huge amount of different types of noodles is everyone kind of adding a new shape and a new style and getting around the fact that, um, you know, a whole wheat flour was not as attractive for a while. So they would put a thin layer of that between two mm. uh, thin layers of white noodles. So the noodle looked white, but, um, but was actually mostly whole grain because it was mm. cheaper at the time. Um, you know that that was a that was a, a fun and 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 you know, exhausting for the stomach. Yeah. <laughs> trip. And that actually we didn't even mention that we that was not even at the noodle school, the noodle restaurant, uh, or the noodle <laughs> private room. But that was in a village in, in a tourist village, an hour and a half outside of Taiyuan. An amusement park for noodles. An amusement park for noodles, <laughs> where they had. I think a, at least a dozen different stalls, and each one of them had to do a different noodle. Yeah. And they had to do it the traditional way, uh -huh. and they couldn't repeat themselves. And there was a standout for me, which was a type of noodle, um, a sorghum noodle, was it? That was pressed. A buckwheat noodle. A buckwheat noodle that was pressed through um, a, a little sieve, and the, and the amount of pressure that was required to do that meant that they had this long railway tie uh, as, a, as a lever to push it down, and the only way to do that was to get some little lady to just sit on this, <laughs> on this railway tie to squeeze out the noodles and then stand up again and sit right. down, and this lady was just standing up and sitting down right. on some rickety dining room table <laughs> to try to squeeze out... <laughs> Buckwheat noodle after buckwheat noodle. <laughs> right, right. So we saw a lot of noodles. We, ate we, a lot of we saw a lot of noodles. We ate a lot of noodles, <laughs> but uh, it still wasn't enough. I mean, I think we need to go back. Oh, yeah. um, oh we yes. need to go back and film more. We need to go back for the wheat harvest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, hopefully this year. Mm -hmm. um, we need to go back and see how these noodles are made at home mm -hmm. and how they're made in the different regions of Shanxi. Mm -hmm. Because in the south is is white flour, and the in the middle is white flour plus the the coarse grains, and then the north near Inner Mongolia are the coarse grains, and how all of those kind of interact with each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And as you said, go through different periods of popularity depending on the. Yeah. Level of nostalgia, on economic conditions. On, yeah. On and when you think about something like a, a noodle, uh, again, like the wok, it's such a simple everyday item. But when you look at the number of stories that we have access to in terms of uh, just the angles and the directions we can go into. We can go all the way back to the farming of, of the wheat. Uh, that area is a massive area for, for growing wheat. And you can go all the way down to, you know, the creation of it, that guy in the restaurant blowing a balloon, of mm. um, a, a noodle balloon. And mm. there's almost an infinite number of stories that can mm. be told around a bowl of noodles. And just around the, just around the noodles in Shanxi, yeah. which is which claims to be the the heartland of, of noodles in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean not to mention all the other provinces in China that that make and eat various noodles. You, you could spend years yeah. just just tracing the ones that that we looked at for yeah. you know for a few days. I kept thinking on that trip, you know, we always hear about Italy and pasta and Italy and pasta, pasta equals Italy, blah, blah, blah. And then you go there and it just puts to shame the number of, of different shapes and styles and, and things mm. like that. I mean, you could eat for a thousand years in, in Shanxi and never, never have the same noodle mm. twice. There's just hundreds and hundreds of different mm. shapes and types of, of noodles and the way it's created and, and the history around it mm. as well. So hopefully we captured a little bit of that in the videos that we made yeah. um, in our time there. Mm -hmm. So as I got deeper into the noodle world, uh, one of my topics of focus was Lamian. And um, in 2016, I even went to school in Lanzhou to learn how to, how to make Lamian. And um, Jia Li, uh, who did the walk video, uh, we also made a video called Noodle School in 2018 uh, about the school that I went to and the students who were there. And um, it was on one of those trips that I learned about the conflict um, in the noodle world, in the Lanzhou Lamian noodle world. And so there's two sides to the Lanzhou Lamian noodle world. Very, very basically, there's the Lanzhou side, which is what everybody thinks about when they hear about Lanzhou Lamian. Lanzhou Lamian, yeah. And then there is the Qinghai side, which kind of seems like a shadow industry almost. Um, 
we, we don't really hear about the Qinghai, the Qinghai side of, of Laomian, but it's an industry that's equal in size to the Lanzhou noodle industry, about three billion U.S. dollars a year. And um, last year, we were able to track down the one guy who started this industry, yeah. kicking off the entire Qinghai Lamian noodle industry in the 1980s, mm. who is still alive, living in Xining, mm -hmm. friendly guy, lovely guy, took us to see his the childhood home, mm -hmm. where he grew up in the, in the countryside of Hualong County. Mm -hmm. uh, and we traveled around there with him and, and with a few other people um, to just kind of capture the story of the capture a side of the industry mm -hmm. um, that that never gets told, at least mm -hmm. in English. And Hualang as as a as a region as well, I mean this is a this is an area that thrives on noodle money. I mean, yeah. walking around his old um, village and everyone's renovating their houses and uh, updating their houses and this is all It's all noodle money. And as we were driving on the road, we stopped to get a little yogurt on the side of the road. And two ladies were there, had both worked in Shanghai and had both been working in noodle shops in Shanghai, noodle shops that we probably have been to. And um, it, it really showed how this one county was really dedicated to uh, to opening noodle shops around China. Mm -hmm. And so much so that they had an entire noodle institution that mm -hmm. we got to tour around and, and see uh, all of the support, the help desks that people were able to call to get help and support around their noodles. It really is that government has really made a focus on yeah. we, we got to support these noodle shops. Around it's, a mass, it's a massive industry. Mm -hmm. I, one out of three people in Hualong County work in the Lanzhou Lamian or in the Lamian industry. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't call it Lanzhou Lamian. They call it, that's a very sensitive point, point of contention, but it's the Lamian industry. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a, 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 a quite a poor county, mm -hmm. uh, predominantly Muslim, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of other industry there. And out of the 300,000 residents, more than 100,000 of those people work in Lamian shops across China. Mm -hmm. So when you go to uh, a Lamian place, even here in Shanghai, um, the odds are at least 50-50 that the guys who are pulling the noodles, who are working the shop, the women who are working in the shop mm -hmm. uh, are from Qinghai. Mm -hmm. And if they're from Qinghai, they're probably from Hualong County. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mr. Han as well, who, who we got to spend some time with, um, who is, who is the guy who, who really started this and hearing his story and, and talking to him about his little tent that he set up in Tibet and then how he moved around and, um, slowly and steadily managed to, carve out a really incredible business for himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, slowly growing it to where, where it is now. I mean, he's only got one shop that we got to spend uh, a morning in watching how these noodles are made and, and the process and watching them fling the noodles mm -hmm. across the, the stainless steel counter for, for the guy to pick up and put into a bowl. Um, a really incredible visual process. I mean, that was for me, shooting in, in kitchens around China is always such a joy because they're so slick and they're so, you know, there's such a pace and, and rhythm to these kitchens and seeing that was incredible, but also seeing his story about how he also opened international noodle shops. You know, he, he was opening shops outside of China in, as well. Indonesia. He, he lived in Indonesia for a while. even. Yeah. And just the coolest guy with all the photos of him with his, his car that he used to drive. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, as a taxi driver, yeah. <laughs> he was a taxi driver. He mined for gold. Mm -hmm. He traded socks. Mm -hmm. um, he did all kinds of things. A real story of that entrepreneurial spirit that you, yeah. you see in so many of these areas around, around China. And then also watching the new generations of noodle makers that kind of followed in his footsteps and created the world that we know of today, which is there's a, a, a pulled noodle shop on, on every corner in China. I mean, right. it's, it's, it's such a standard staple uh, around China. And so seeing that story was yeah. incredible. And it's so rare that you can actually um, pinpoint mm -hmm. kind of the genesis mm -hmm. of an industry that you can trace it back to one guy and say, this was the guy, mm -hmm. this was his idea. Yeah. And he's still around, mm -hmm. you know, and we met him and we were in his apartment and, you know, talking to him and his wife served us tea and his yeah. grandkid came home from school, <laughs> you know, and his shop was right downstairs of his apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ate noodles with him in his shop. Yeah, yeah, we ate noodles with him in his shop. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the story of Mr. Han mm -hmm. and uh, what we'll show with the Qinghai Lamian story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after making these videos and just kind of chasing our interests, we're now moving into a more structured direction. 
Our goal for 2024 and beyond is to build a YouTube channel about Chinese food and food culture as it's lived in China for an audience overseas. So why YouTube and not Chinese media? We think it's important that China's voice is represented in the global conversation about food in a way that's more complex and nuanced and story-driven than what's already out there. We want to add some depth to the China food story and to use this new platform to tell new stories or at least tell old stories in a new way and help share the tremendous reserve of food wisdom that's sort of locked up in the Chinese-speaking world. Graham and I are both outsiders and sometimes the outsider's perspective is, is useful. At the same time, we don't speak for China, we speak for ourselves. We want to give as much space to Chinese people to tell their own stories as we can and to help them do that. But sometimes that needs someone who understands both cultures to a degree and knows how to explain something from one culture in a way that people from a different culture might understand. We're both in a good position to do this. I was a chef for 10 years and speak the kind of universal kitchen language. I've been in China for 20 years, always involved in food. Graham's been in China for more than a decade and has traveled more in China than anyone I know. So we're not Chinese, but we aren't newcomers either. We didn't fly in for this story. We live here. But if you've actually traveled in China, if you travel a lot in China, mm. everything kind of looks the same. Mm-hmm. You know, there are cities that are a little bit different. There are villages that are a little bit different. But a lot of the time, it's quite depressing how similar everything looks. Especially when you roll into the same train station design. <laughs> yeah, or the same airport mm-hmm. design. It's hard to tell where you, it can be hard to tell where you are just just visually and looking at the architecture around you or the urban planning or the brands that are around you. Um, but one thing that you really do see the diversity in um, is, is the food. Mm. And while the restaurants might look the same or the cities might look the same, you really get a sense of place by eating in different areas and understanding what's different here versus there, even when here is the west side of the river and there is the east side of the river. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's just so much incredible diversity Mm -hmm. uh, around the food. It's probably, it's kind of a cultural repository for me. Mm -hmm. I think that I don't know anywhere else that you see so much diversity um, in Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. Finding and, and highlighting that diversity uh, is what keeps it fresh for us. I mean, together we've been working in food or documenting food in some way for a combined 30 years in China now. Um, and we still step off a train station in whatever province and it feels like something totally new. The first meal is always like, wow, mm-hmm. I didn't know that it was like this. <laughs> I didn't know that I didn't know that this existed before. I didn't know it was so special. I didn't know it was so different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what is keeping me going. Um, And I I suspect keeping you going as well. Absolutely. And so we want to show that um, and share that for the upcoming upcoming videos that we do and the episodes that we do. And we hope that you guys will watch.